Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Sargent, Chevy Chase at Homes Member and Volunteer Programs Manager. As many of you already know, Chevy Chase at Home engages adults 55 and over in social and educational programming, both in person and virtually. We also provide volunteer services to older adults who need assistance to remain at home, including rides, tech support, and minor household chores. We are so glad to have you join us this afternoon for our speaker series. Susan Post, who is a member of Chevy Chase at Home's Board of Directors, the chair of our interest groups committee, and a dedicated volunteer and longtime member, is going to introduce our speaker, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, and moderate today's talk. Uh, just a note of housekeeping, if you do have a question during the, during the talk, just feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, and Susan, myself, or Swanee, we'll, we'll be happy to um, have your question. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and welcome, Ambassador Hunt. Ambassador Hunt served as ambassador to Austria from 1993 to 1997 under President Clinton. And it was during this time that she began, came involved in efforts for peace in the neighboring Balkan countries, especially war-torn Bosnia. She has written several books on the subject of involving women in the peacemaking and peacekeeping processes in Bosnia and Rwanda, and sees including women in local and national governments as critical. Raised in an unusual family in Dallas, as a young woman, she slipped the bonds of her family's Southern conservatism to become an activist in Denver, Colorado, where she ran her own foundation, Hunt Alternatives. Ambassador Hunt founded the Women and Public Policy Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and is the author of four books and many articles. Most recently, she has become involved in the effort to stop sex trafficking. Among her many talents, Ambassador Hunt is also a musician playing piano, guitar, and harp. Um, I've posted some links for everybody in the chat, uh, some to the work she's done and one to a magnificent cantata that she wrote and produced here and in Boston and I think in many cities. Um, so Ambassador Hunt, do you wanna begin by sort of sharing uh, some of the personal development that you went through as a child and young woman growing up in Dallas, Texas, and later in Denver and Europe. Uh, yeah, I bet, Susan, I can't start anything like that until I thank you. And it is so much fun to work with you. And we have known each other indirectly for a long time, about 30 years. And I, um, I admire you greatly, and I hear stories about you. So uh, <laughs> that's that. kind of scary. <laughs> right. Um, I guess, and, and I was talking with Susan a lot about, you know, who is going to be on this call and what you all want to hear about. And so I, um, I'm happy to, to answer Susan's questions and give you some thoughts, but I really would like this to be a conversation. So as you have any comments about what I'm saying, or or if you uh, have some questions, please, please ask. But on the other hand, if you want to just change the subject, I'll go with it. You know, one of the things you learn to do when you're ambassador is you pivot, right? <laughs> Person asks you a question, you say, what an interesting question. And then you answer something else totally differently. So uh, now that I've said that, you'll notice as you listen to politicians. Susan, uh, I was born in 1950, and which makes me a solid baby boomer, but I was born into this very, very conservative family in Dallas, Texas, which is a very, very conservative part of the United States. So living on the East Coast, it's really interesting to see how long it takes for changes on the coast to to make their way over to Dallas. So 
add like three or four years when you think about my age. And uh, I went to really good school, girls' school for 10 years, Hockaday. Really, really good school. I have two masters and a doctorate, and really the the best part of my education was in this really fine, fine girls' school. But the story really starts before that kind of predictable scene. And that is that my mother was seduced by my father, who was the age of her father, when she was about 24. She'd grown up on a farm in the uh, outside the town limits of Idabel, Oklahoma, on a gravel road. The family was very poor. She wanted roller skates more than anything in the whole world, and they couldn't afford them. And by roller skates, I mean the clip-ons that nowadays would cost maybe like 75 cents. And um, and yet to give you a sense of her, she, she wrote poetry all the time from the time she was really young. And so they had uh, they published her poems in the McCurtain County Gazette, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this letter to Santa that she wrote that I have framed. And in it, she says, dear Santa, uh, my brother, um, Jimmy wants a um, a toy horse, and and my brother Billy wants a ball, and my my mother she wants chocolates, and please don't forget the poor the poor children. And that was so striking to me that here was a person who couldn't get the clip on roller skates, who was ask really asking Santa to help the poor children. That's who mom was. And so if you imagine her, she had a year of college because her older five sibs put their money together to buy her a year of college because none of them could afford that. I'm not sure all of them finished high school. Their mom's dad had died, leaving these six children. And so, um, that's who she was in terms of her generosity for her whole life. And after that one year in college, she went to live with her Aunt Swan, hence my name, except Aunt Swan married Charlie Lake. Now, I didn't have that much imagination, but my Aunt Swan became, obviously, Swan Lake. But <laughs> she lived in Louisiana, so she would say, hi, my name is... Are you ready for this? My name is Swan Lake. It really is. And so she got some a certain amount of mileage uh, out of being Swan Lake. It really is. So we can you hear Susan? Okay. Yeah, I there are some notes in this in the chat, Kristen um, and Swanee, that the sound is not good for Ambassador Hunt, that it's very muffled. Um, is, is anyone else having trouble hearing? You are? No. Uh -huh. uh, did the note come for you, from you all, Karen? No, it came from other people. Oh. Does it help? Are, you, are you close enough to your computer? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. It sounds muffled somehow. It does sound muffled? Yeah. Can you do something about this? Hmm. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> we'll try to fix this. Oh. We can hear you clearly, Susan. It's the ambassador who comes through is somewhat muffled. Okay. Just trying to get help here. But, so now, did that make any difference? Yes. Really, yeah. or is it better if I not not much different? A little, a little better. No, that it's helped a lot. little bit better. That helped a lot. What would you ask? Um, I said it helped a lot. Then somebody said it's a little bit better. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Go down. What are my options here? Sure. This is Katie Adele. Hi, guys. Hi, Kate. I'll, I'll go on and speak 
since the time is limited, but I'll, sure. I'll speak more loudly. Does that help? Loudly uh, or more slowly? Ah, there, right there. That's, okay. that's very good. Yeah. Okay, good. We, we switched to another microphone. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Now, I wonder what you heard. So can, you, you were talking about your mom. It was very, very, yeah. very generous and also very naive in many ways. And so she goes to live with her Aunt Swan. And um, one day she doesn't come home. And Aunt Swan, who's seven years older than she is, maybe 13 years older, is panicked. And uh, the reason she didn't come home was that my father, who was the age of her father, had been walking down the hall of the law firm that represented him and had seen this young secretary. And I haven't, well, I wasn't there, but I can tell you, I don't think that my mother was seducing him. And I especially don't think that because he had another mistress also. And so that give that paints a picture of my father who had another mistress, had six children with his wife, and then four children at the same, they're all mixed in age, at the same time with his other mistress. He and the mistress break up. He seduces my mother, who is 30 years younger, and she starts having babies. She has five babies within seven years because that's what he wanted. He wanted to have progeny. He believed he had a genius gene and he wanted to pass it on. I and mean, there's a lot that's wrong with this picture. I was number 15 of them all. And it was not a happy childhood by any stretch of the imagination. He was not a nice man. And one of the interesting things though, was that he never accepted the idea that there were limitations. That's why in his personal life, he, he said, well, Solomon had a lot of wives, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, I say all of that to say that you never, ever know what's going on in a person's life, a person who's very successful or a person who is in a penitentiary for, with serving a life sentence. You never, ever know. And we need to take that in. And if I could say nothing else today, I think that would be enough of a message. To, to myself, because Susan, this has been really helpful to have me think, talking to you and then thinking about what do I have to say? Like, who am I and what can I contribute? Anybody can read my Wikipedia page. Anyone can know um, parts of my career. The Wikipedia page is filled with successes for the most part. All that is, is, is window dressing. Oh, oh, it's meaningful. It's meaningful. I don't mean to say that, but it doesn't describe me. It describes actions, but it doesn't describe who I am, just like yours wouldn't describe who you are. And I think so much about why I do the work I do. And, and I have two sisters who do similar kinds of work. And it's really clear to me that we are doing the work for women because we're doing it for our mother. My mother couldn't leave my father. She had not just one child, but another, another, another. And how, I mean, this is, this is the 50s. How is she going to support herself and any children? She had some kind of bare allowance from my father. We lived six minutes away from his big mansion. There's so much about this that isn't that isn't good. His mansion being called Mount Vernon. It, it, is, it was a replica of Mount Vernon. Right. And so all the trappings were there. Uh, eventually, his wife died, and he then, we moved in with him. And he adopted us, which was really redundant. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and, but my name was changed. I had a fictitious father. I had a fictitious name. 
My mother had a fictitious name before we moved in. My mother, who may have been the most amiable, gregarious, funny, uh, generous person I've ever known, had no friends because she was a, well, they would. They would have said, well, where's your husband? And what I was told was that he was in the foreign service. Someone else she told was in, that he was uh, in the uh, armed forces. Her family back on the farm in Idabel, Oklahoma, they didn't even know where she was for years. She had just disappeared. So and I was thinking, yeah. Do you want to say a little bit about who your father was? Sure. <laughs> yeah, dad was a gambler. He he actually never went to school at all. He what? Never went to school at all. And um, but he was a prodigious gambler and he was like a card shark, it was a, like a savant. And and so he would he came into a ten thousand um, dollar uh, gift when his father died, inheritance, and with that he bought into a lease in uh, on Arkansas Texas border and an oil oil and gas, and he was in a gambling game after that. And he won another lease to drill on. And when he did, it was the discovery well of the largest oil field in the world. This is all before the Middle East oil finds. So he goes from being this, I'm going to say unschooled. I'd start to say uneducated, but it's hard to be uneducated when you're out there in the world, right? You're, you become self-educated, the unschooled gambling guy to uh, being considered certainly the richest man in, in our country, but some, like Time Magazine said he may be the richest man in the world. And he said he stopped, Susan, I didn't tell you, he stopped smoking cigars because he figured how much money he's, he could be making in the seconds that he was taking the uh, wrapper off the cigar. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it was just dad being dad, right? But he was 61 when I was born. And I didn't know he was my father. He would come once a week to visit my mother and us kids. I just knew there was an old man because at that point, 61 looked very old. Uh, and so here's mom. She's in a crisis of conscience. She's very, very religious. So she has, in her mind, she has sullied the name of her father that she worshiped, meaning her father who died. And that's the background to all of this. Dad grew tired of the oil and gas business. He instead latched on to the anti-communist movement. And, you know, and the communist, what's happening in Europe was real. And there really, truly was a red menace. And I particularly having lived now four years in Germany and four years in Austria, and the stories I've heard over and over and over and over, it was really, really scary what was happening to people with the, the knock in the middle of the night. And family members they would never see again, and, 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 and. So he this was the time, remember Kukchev and in the, at the UN banging his shoe and saying, we will bury you, et cetera, et cetera. And that was all real. At the time, however, there was a communist around every corner. There was, you know, Martin Luther King was a communist dupe. Um, Jack Kennedy was a communist. Um, the, the principal of our school, our high school was a communist. We had to go to a college that was 10 minutes away uh, SMU, Southern Methodist University, because all of the schools in the country were run by communists, including SMU, but at least he could keep an eye on us 
because we were 10 minutes away. So it was it was crazy kind of obsession. But because he was so wealthy, he didn't pay a price for that. He was extraordinarily anti-Semitic, as a lot of, by the way, you should see the stats of middle America in terms of the anti-Semitism. It will blow you away. But still, people from farms, right? But he was so anti-Semitic that we weren't allowed to shop in a store that was owned by Jews. I was not allowed to play with the only girl within walking distance of our home, our big mansion, because she was Jewish. So that was home. We didn't have any conversations at the dinner table because he would put his radio program, he put the radio, transistor radio on the table, and we would listen to his program called Lifeline. And after 15 minutes of hearing anti-communist rhetoric, then he would change the channel and we would hear another 15 minutes, you know, and this was all across the South. So it wasn't a happy experience. And Susan, do you want to add anything right now before no, I... No, I guess I just want to um, ask how you moved out of that and created yeah. a whole worldview of your own and began activities that certainly, uh, I'm sure, pleased your mother and befuddled your father if he was still alive at that time. You know, it's perfect that you asked that in that way. What happened is I became very, very involved in First Baptist Church, and it was a lifesaver for me and for all of us teenagers who were there. I spent 18 hours a week in church, fundamentalist. It was it was such a warm, inviting, loving. It you know it didn't the idea of uh, any of the the meanness of anyone who doesn't agree with us is going to hell. That what that didn't even come close to the importance of the love and acceptance that we felt there. And so, what happened, Susan? is that that was the place that the generosity was taught us by my mother, et cetera, and in, in the religious teachings. And one of the things, we, we sang songs like, um, there was, does it make any difference to you? Does it make any difference to you? If a soul dies in sin, God has called you to win. Does it make any difference to you? Now, you could say, oh, my God, God has called you to win this soul, right? And yet, the, the question is, does it make any difference? And that's a, that's a remarkable combination of thoughts. Do you care? So that was the church. That was my mother. And my father, I already said, didn't know limits. He didn't know no speed limits. He didn't have limits in his own mind. He did what he wanted. But from that, I learned a very important lesson that life and, and what you decide to do with your life is not about the guardrails. It's not about even what is it possible to do. The question is what needs to be done? Where, what is the North Star? What needs to happen in the world? And when you combine that with the idea of I'm responsible for what's going on, a certain empathy with the fact that there's nothing to keep me from doing what I see needs to be done. That's a, that's a really compelling way to, to see your life, to see your possibilities, to see your career. And I used to lie in bed at night as a girl. I remember 12 years old lying there and thinking with real angst. I mean, meaning tossing and turning and, you know, staring at the, you know, what am I going to do if I can't, if I don't make the most of my life? That was the standard. It wasn't what, you know, 
I want to become a doctor. I want to go to, a, you know, this or that. It was about what if broadly, if I don't make the most of my life, because I have good health, I have money, I have a good education. What if I don't do everything I can with that? So you married um, a young man who was studying for the ministry. Right. Right. And moved to Denver first or, or Germany? We, we moved to Germany to get as far away from my family as possible, which is a smart thing to do. And, and while it, there. And, and Mark was, he was the person who was politically really to the left. I mean, he had moved and, and, and we'd moved together. And this was the time of the women's movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. And so in the air, there was change and we were changing with it. And I went to theology. I then went to school, got a degree in counseling, got a, a degree in theology, eventually got a doctorate in theology. And it wasn't along the lines of the church I had been taught. But it was very much along the lines of um, a concept of God that to me was extremely important. And the concept is built not around Easter. I'm not, I don't, Easter isn't, I don't understand Easter. I'm not particularly taken with Easter. But to me, it's Christmas and it's, it's Good Friday because Christmas, God is born in a barn. Everyone is looking for a, a messiah and instead god comes to earth in the form of a baby of unwed teenager and there's not any room god is homeless a homeless child of an unwed teenager mm. and that is powerful that is powerful and if you interpret the teachings of jesus through that lens, you will find that theme over and over. Remember, Jesus was not a Christian. Okay. I love that, you know. And, and so that became what was compelling to me. The other part in the theology was that he ended up being tortured and dying. And that to me is the most important that, that, in whatever is happening to us, God is there. God is with us. God is on the cross. And there is no cross that we are going to be on that God cannot be on. And when I say God, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to, how to describe. For me, God is just not describable. It's certainly not. He doesn't live on the, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Right. Um, but I, I think of God as a power, as a context in which we live, as extraordinarily a source of love. And if we can somehow tap into that source, then then we have a possibility of making a difference in the world. And so you and your sister? I think Helen created Hunt Alternatives, yep. is that right? And you eventually moved to Denver where you became involved in um, a lot of proactive social activity. Do you want to talk about some of the work that you started there and that the I think the foundation continues? Yes, what we did in Denver we first of all we started the foundation because i read an article in forbes magazine that i had all kinds of money <laughs> i'm not kidding none of the girls knew that i and i thought who are they describing and then i started digging around and realized in fact the dad had died there was all this money and um and it was a whole male female thing it really was that my brother was the head of the company he would say how much do you want as an allowance for this year essentially and what we were asking for was a ridiculously small amount given the size of the company 
so so there was that whole business about justice right right there but when we started the foundation we were a grant making foundation and uh so we would give our, our niche was to give grants to organizations that were small because we only had like we would give four or five or six thousand dollars today it would be like ten thousand and we did 500 of these to 400 organizations but everyone we gave to we spent time with them we did site visits with them we got to know the people who were leading them we put 10 of the leaders together we put 40 of the leaders together so people were really surprised when when i left to find out how tiny we were i mean we had gotten bigger much bigger eventually but but they were very surprised because we had so much effect and I particularly focused on mental health because my husband and I, Mark, we started a halfway house for people who either were coming out of mental hospitals or were in danger of, of going into them. And I could do that. And I trained as a chaplain in a mental hospital. I could do that because around our dinner table growing up with the transistor radio, radio on the table was my father's oldest son from his wife, who was the age of my mother. And he was a paranoid schizophrenic who had been lobotomized. And he was very, very sick. And the psychotropic drugs that were discovered later really didn't have much effect. He was so, so sick. So he would, like, if I came into a room, he would say, vicious killer, vicious killer, vicious killer, eyes can kill, eyes can kill, eyes can kill. And that was the environment in which I'd grown up. I was accustomed to it. It wasn't hard for me to go into a mental hospital. But what happened there, Susan, I, I saw how screwed up our mental health system was because for all the right reasons, we had divided the country into catchment areas, as they were called, with, by, by the population. And so that works in some ways, unless you're schizophrenic. Because if you're schizophrenic, it's very likely that you are going to be a terrible tenant when you're renting, you're not going to pay your rent, you're going to get kicked out of your apartment building or whatever, and you're going to end up even six blocks away in another catchment. You've got, they don't know who you are. You've got a different psychiatrist or therapist. I mean, everything about it is hard. It's so destabilizing. So I said, this is a mess. We've got to reform the whole thing. And that's where you see dad coming in and saying, okay, this system isn't working. Got to do it differently. We did. I chaired the governor's effort on homelessness. I chaired the mayor's efforts on mental health. And, and that was a real growing up experience, obviously. But during that time is when our daughter started showing signs of mental illness. Really, from the time she was in the crib, she could not calm herself. And that was always part of my life. It still is for 39 years, 40 years, always part of it, even though now I'm happy to sort of get to quickly tell you that she saved, she became stable when she was about 28 years old. And she's now married and she has way too many children. She way too <laughs> Six children. I told her, honey, when you name those kids a name I can spell, I will remember their birthday, but not before. <laughs> so that's Lillian, and and she is a friend of Bob Post too. And so I appreciate the Post family enormously. So you um, eventually divorced, right? Broke my heart. I know, and married a musician, conductor, and I'm not sure exactly of the chronology, but when did you become involved in politics that led you to end up 
in Vienna as the ambassador to Austria under President Clinton. And I hope you'll talk a little bit about some of your work in the surrounding area during the Balkan troubles and uh, Rwanda and the whole notion of the importance of women in government and in peacemaking and peacekeeping around the world. Mm -hmm. Sure, because it's all of a piece as, as our lives are. Our lives, when you look at them from the outside and we, we may say, oh, that person did this and then that person did that. It's not that way, as you know, it's all integrated. You take a situation with you. And, and so for me, getting involved with politics came straight out of my work on homelessness because Ronald Reagan had cut 80% of the public housing uh, through HUD. And all of a sudden, there are all these people sleeping on the sidewalks. And then soon after was the comment, well, some people like to sleep on grades. You know, and, and so I, I, that's when I became political. Because I thought with one stroke of the pen, he was able to undo years and years of my work on homelessness. And the, the campaign that I became involved in for the first time ever, ever with anything national was when um, Bill Clinton was running for president. And it wasn't because of Bill Clinton. It was because of Hillary Clinton. When I met her, she and I spent the whole time talking about high school dropouts and what to do about that crisis in America. Because one of the one of the causes that I had given a lot to over the years had been about the public education system. She never asked me for a nickel in all the years I've known her. Never a nickel. Because we would get together and we would talk about what was happening that why were women making 49 cents on a man's dollar, et cetera, et cetera. So she asked me to be part of the administration. I thought I would go to DC and work on welfare reform because that would make sense. And I was <laughs> strongly advised don't do that because Washington will be awash with Democrats who want to work on these social issues. So I went to Vienna, as you were saying, and I told my friends who said, what, what are you doing? I mean, like, have you gotten tired of, of our work? And I said, of course not. And if I go and it's cocktail parties, I'll be back. I'll be back in a year. And it could have been cocktail parties, except Vienna was the last jumping off, dropping off place before you fell into hell. You fell into concentration camps. You fell into a three and a half year siege. You you fell into the shelling of maternity hospitals. You fell into 100,000 people killed out of four, out of a country of 4 million, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You fell in children running through Sniper Alley to get to school and the parents having to decide from their, from their whole, you know, of a, of, of a um, basement room where they had been for three years. Do I let them go to school, et cetera? This so, is Sarajevo? This is, yes, this is Bosnia, right. And Sarajevo is the capital. So I became very, very, very involved and was asked by the State Department if I would go, and it was very dangerous, if I would go and meet with the women, if I could find the women there. And I did. There were 40 women's associations across the country, this little country, 40, each one multi-ethnic, each one trying to prevent the war, and then afterwards trying to stop the war, and afterwards trying to stabilize so the country didn't go back into war. And of every experience I've had in my life, I, uh, that of course was the big change because when I asked the women for it's a long story, I won't go into it, but if they could come together, the, the, there was genocide going on. This was not ethnic, this was not religious, it was a power grab. And, and the genocide was against the Muslims and the Muslims were being uh, attacked by the Serbs, the Christians, by the way, the Christian Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Christians were attacking the Muslims, let's be really clear. And, I was meeting with the women and they were saying, 
we will work together. We do work together. We're all mothers. And I thought, what if that is true? You don't have to be mothers, but what if women will work together? And the United Nations said to me, when I said, how come there aren't any women in the negotiating teams? There's 60 wars at a time going on in the world. How come there aren't any women in these negotiating teams? I was told the warlords won't have women because they're afraid the women will compromise. And I thought, bingo. What if? What if you ended the war in Afghanistan one week earlier? You could provide clean water for every village in the world. So for me, it was about leverage. And I came to teach at Harvard for 20 years at the Kennedy School of Government and teach on this subject and started this huge effort, which actually became a, created a change in foreign policy for the United States and really around the world. And we ended up with a law in the Senate that was uh, demanded that women be very involved in any decisions about war and peace and that they be at the negotiating table. So I feel very good about that. But as I said, you bring your past with you. And part of my past was the unfairness toward my mother, but the other one was our daughter Lillian. And I just said one sentence that our daughter became mentally ill and throughout this time, she had five suicide attempts. She became drastically, drastically psychotic, swinging and extreme multi, I mean, extreme manic depressive. She was so rapid cycling. She in the morning could be, you know, like swinging me around and she had found a cure for her cancer. And by night, she couldn't even hold a deck of cards to play gin rummy with me because she was so depressed. And, and so then I would go to my big desk as ambassador, or I would go to my, my class at Harvard to teach, and I would be hearing she's threatening to kill herself, and you know she's in and out of mental hospitals. And I heard there was one person that I hadn't met with, and his name was Bob Post, and I ought to try to find him. I found him at the National Institute of Health, and told him we had tried everything. And he said, well, what do you mean tried everything? You haven't tried everything. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I have some possibilities here. I have a group of, uh, we're getting some better uh, results so from something I'm trying to put together. And I said, well, well, he told me what it is. And he drew all these long chains. And he, this long chain reminded me why I didn't take chemistry. And then at the end of this explanation, he took his pencil and he crossed it out. He said, no, let's not do that one. Let's do this. And it was crazy. It was just a crazy conversation. And I said, well, can I bring her to meet you? I said, oh, I don't need to meet her. You've told me all about her. I thought this is, everything about this is nuts. And he saved her life. He absolutely saved her life. And he gave her a combination of of new medications that that really helped her stabilize enough to where she could put together a life. Of course, there was the breakthrough psychosis and the, you know extreme mood swings, but enough there where I knew I, there was that daughter inside of her that I thought I had lost forever. You're muted, Susan. I said it's an amazing story. And uh, what, she has six children now or something like that? Something like this. It's either four or 14. I'm not sure. <laughs> How did you decide to write the cantata that you wrote? What brought you to that? You said was, you were a musician even before you met. Charles Swanee's sure. second husband was um, a world-renowned musician, composer, conductor, traveled all over the world himself, sometimes with you and sometimes on his own, conducting orchestras internationally. Susan, uh, I never took any music theory, but I sure sang a lot in church choirs. And I sang also 
natural harmony. I could sing the soprano, the alto, and the tenor and take the bass and put it up an octave higher because that's what we did in our family. There were two sisters and we were like the Hunt sisters, and, you know, and so I had an ear for it. And um, when Charles and I had our first date, I, after Mark and I split up, I got you all. My preacher husband left me for the church piano player. I just have to tell you, if he didn't have more imagination than that, it wasn't going to work anyway. But we were together for 15 years. Okay, so uh, that's where the cantata came from, the theme. It's all about Good Friday, to the point I was making earlier. It's all about Good Friday. And it's based on what's called the seven last words of Christ. And those are what he said up on the cross. You take all the different gospels and their stories. And one of them is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you know some of these, even if you don't associate them with being Jesus on the cross. It's those kinds of very important statements. So, uh, but, but on our first date, Susan, after Charles, Mark, and I were divorced, and I were divorced, did meet Charles. We went out, we were we went to a symphony. I was 35. It was my first time to ever go to a symphony. I whispered to Charles, what's the long black one? And he said, that's an oboe. <laughs> so I had already written the cantata before <laughs> I knew what an oboe was because I did it by ear. And uh Writing a cantata is actually very hard, but yes, please. Actually, I just wanted to note to everybody that I've put up in the chat a whole bunch of online references. The last one of which is the cantata. And on that, if you if you scroll down, you can actually hear it and you can hear Swanee being interviewed about how she came to write it and what it all means. Um. And, and Susan, the words are the most important because the words are poetry. That is modern poetry. It's well, there's a passage by Eli Wiesel, but there's uh, poetry of Anakhmatova, a Russian poet whose only son was imprisoned, a political prisoner for for 17 years, and she was the voice of the people. It's I mean, the really heartbreaking stories, and they are writing. It um, uh, they are writing their poetry out of the depths, as Kierkegaard would say. And I took what they said and linked it to one of the traditional seven last words. And that's how the cantata is structured. So if you do listen to it, be sure that you're reading the poetry that goes with it, because that's what the singers are singing. And I see if if you have trouble finding it, someone will get it, get the link to you. But out of that came, Susan, my work all over the world. I worked in 60 countries um, and working with top women leaders to get them organized. They were teaching me, but to get them organized to be a force so that I could come in and meet with the prime minister or the foreign minister and say, not only can you not tell me you don't have women who would be appropriate to be at the negotiating table. There are about 30 people on each side of a negotiation to end the war. Uh, don't tell me you don't have women. Here are their names. Here's the bio. Here's the email address. And here's the phone number. And we have vetted them. And out of that has come some really significant change in foreign policies. The, the chief champion of that was Hillary Clinton, by the way, and her work at the State Department, where she required every office at the State Department to come up with their plan for the year of how they would be elevating women leaders. And, you know, God bless her, right? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I guess we're close to the witching hour, but I wondered if anyone has questions that they would like to pose to, to Ambassador Hunt. Um, and you can either type them in the chat 
or you can just raise your hand. Let's see, if I go to gallery view, if anyone wants, wants to raise a hand and ask a question, feel free. I don't have a question, but I would just love to tell you what an inspirational person you are. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> I really are. Your talk was, was delightful. And I'm so glad that you work with Hillary Clinton, who should have been president of the United States. She certainly should have been. You know, I won't say she lost. I never say that. I say she didn't win. Yeah. Oh, but Susan, Susan, before, okay, I, let me, if, even if this is the last thing, other Susan, but I do want to tell Susan Hamburger this, okay? And everyone. I cried. I cried for four months. Oh, we all I did. I stop crying for all that time after she didn't win. Lillian had asked me to fly to Denver to be with her daughter. So I would be there when the first woman became president, okay? And Hillary and I have been close friends. Okay, So I, I couldn't, I had the hardest time you know, pulling myself together. And I realized afterwards, it wasn't because a candidate didn't win, someone I could, could make a difference. I realized the extent to which I identified with her. And I had put up with all kinds of stuff I'm not talking about. And, and this was the chance for redemption. This was the chance for a woman like me in the sense just that I'm a woman to become the most powerful person in the world. And I realized that's why it hit me so hard. Yeah. But the beautiful piece is I was talking to Maggie Williams, who'd been her chief of staff, and she said, how are you? And I said, I can't stop crying. And she said, Swanee, let me tell you a story. And this is, this is a fitting wrap up. We need to. She said to me, Swanee, I was in the room when the concession speech, when we were writing it. And afterwards, I went home and the next day there was a knock on the door and it was Hillary. <laughs> and she said, Maggie, I came to see how you're doing. <laughs> and she said to Hillary, I can't stop crying. Yeah. And she said, Maggie, we lost the election. We don't know why. It feels like shit. We're going to find out what we can find out. But we lost the election. And your crying is not going to help. It's not going to bring it back. I need you to make a call to the uh, Children's Defense Fund and tell them I will be there to give the speech day after tomorrow. And I need you to call this foundation for inner city boys. And I need you to let them know that Bill and I will still be supporting their such and such. And I need you to, and she, showed me, she gave her like five or six assignments. Because Maggie had at one point been her chief of staff, right? So she starts just giving her assignments. Like, really? And, and then she calls her the next day and says, Maggie, I wanted to know, did you reach Mary and Wright Edelman at the Children's Defense Fund? And did you call that foundation for inner city boys? And Maggie's saying, okay, Hillary, you know, because she's still crying, right? And she said, Maggie, stop, stop. Crying isn't helping, okay? I need you to do this. And and so she gave her another list. And finally, the third or fourth day, she was calling to give Maggie another list. And Maggie said, Hillary, I've got a day job. <laughs> she was teaching at Harvard. I got a day job. You know, I'll do what I can for you. But what Hillary knew is that you can take anguish and anger and you can turn that into action. And that is one of the most important lessons that every one of us needs to really take in because life can be really, really, really hard. And, and I don't have to explain that to you all. <laughs> the question is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that pain? And for me, I can go back to my mother. I can go back to my father. I can go back to Good Friday. I could go back to women in Rwanda who have lost, who have seen 12 children macheted and then woken up after being gang raped and body parts 
all over the ground from their children. And what do they do? They pick up a spoon because there are no tools. They find a spoon and they start digging a grave because they have to. They have to. And they put one foot in front of the other. Yep. And that's what we're called to do. Yeah. And I, I think that's a wonderful note to end on and a beautiful and important message to all of us to not let ourselves be stymied by external limits, but to do what you've done and look around and see what needs to be done and do it. So did someone have their hands up? No, it was your husband. I was just applauding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I have, to, I have to go to rehab myself and, and get some exercise, but uh, super wonderful. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. So Seriously. much, Ambassador Hunt. Of course. Of course. Okay. Thanks, it's Susan. Been a great pleasure. Thank uh, you. Bye-bye. Thank you to Ambassador Hunt and thank you, Susan, and to all of you for joining Chevy Chase at Home today for our speaker series. I invite you to explore other programming listed on our website and to consider joining your local village as a member or volunteer. Thanks again. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Bye, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.